Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of OSINC Curious's webcast podcast. I am so thrilled that you're here with us today. We've got a great show. We've got lots of different uh, topics to talk about. We've got a bunch of our regulars here, and we have a special guest uh, who we'll introduce right now. Um, Daniel, you want to uh, introduce yourself and tell us who you are? Yeah. So my name is Daniel Clemens, and um, you know I've, I've been involved in the information security community probably a little over 20 years. So, um, you know, I'm the founder of Shadow Dragon and I also own a few other companies. I got a, a pen testing company uh, called Packet Ninjas. That's been around a little bit longer and a few other things, you know, just irons in the fire. I've spent a lot of time behind the scenes and a lot of different things. Um, typically, I've just kind of had the... Uh, the mindset of, you know, just one good job at a time is, is really the main thing to focus on. I don't really care about, you know, getting out there too much. So this is, this is one of the first times I've probably been out on, uh, you know, a video podcast ever. So cool. um, it's just, it's, it's cool. And, and I'm, I'm looking forward to interacting yeah. with everybody, you know. We're absolutely thrilled that you accepted and you decided to come come aboard. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and introduce some of our other regulars here. Uh, Nico? Hi, everyone. The chosen guy back here. Hey, and Technozet? Hi, everybody. I'm Technozet. Sector. Hi, uh, Sector 035 here. Very cool. And last but not least, our last member to join is Curbster. Kirby, you want to say hi? She might not have her mic ready yet. She's still muted. Yeah, yeah, she's still muted. It's all right. She'll join us in a little bit. Um, one of the reasons why we do the verbal um, kind of introductions is that we do a podcast and a webcast. So some of our viewers are going to be watching us on YouTube. Some of them are going to be using one of the various podcasting systems. So we always like to, to do the, both the audio and the video. Also, Welcome to our our guest attendees. So we've got Ginger T, we've got MWO Synth, and 856687KKD51. Um, <laughs> if they type it, I got to read it, which is going to really shoot me in the foot, I think, for future like names of people. Um, so for those of you that are attending live, please remember that you can use the chat at any time and interact with our special guest, Daniel, or any of us uh, during our show. Also, if you are uh, somebody that's listening to this already recorded, feel free to go ahead and use the hashtag OSINT Curious during the week. We'll pick that up and then talk about it in our next show. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and mix things up. We normally will go ahead and go into news of the week, but since you're here, Daniel, I'd love to, to go ahead and start just uh, talking with you and hearing about the cool things that you're doing with Packet Ninjas, uh, Shadow Dragons, and uh, Shadow Dragons, sorry. Um, and also, uh, I think you have a new venture that's starting too, right? Yeah, we, we, we have uh, another team that's being built up right now. Um, we're, we're not really putting too much stuff out on that. Okay. Uh, but primarily, it's just uh, a very focused, um, focused on you know exploit development type stuff. Um, it's, it's probably going to be coming out, you know, probably in about two years. You know, so okay. So putting in the time now and and uh, investing your, uh, for the future. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, for me, like you know, like it's all about business diversification and then doing stuff that's cool, right? And and not not having to. Uh, answer to VC or stuff like that, you know, sure. um, that's kind of been my natural bend on all of this to begin with, uh, for the last 15 years. So that's great. So a lot of people know you from shadow dragon and the right. amazing types of tools, uh, and especially the, the, uh, open source intelligence, um, transforms in Multigo that you're doing. Can you tell us a, a little bit about, uh, like where, sh uh, shadow dragons going and, and all of that? Yeah, so I mean, the main goal of Shadow Dragon is is primarily to give you know analysts some augmentation in their job. You know, we we do we're under no illusion that you know what we what we offer is going to be that silver bullet. Our goal is to to hopefully give you know the analyst that sixty percent solution to augment some of the heavy lifting in some of their job. 
you know, so where I see us going in the future, you know, we're pushing a lot of new OEM integrations with either, you know, social net or OI monitor on the data collection and monitoring side. Um, you know, like those kind of partnerships have been really, you know, budding up in the last year and a half, you know, we had, we had spent a lot of time building the architecture. So, you know, it's not going to be just stuck in Multego or stuck in, you know, one type of link analysis product or, or even our own u user interface. Cause you know, user interfaces are going to change. It's the hipster thing every few months. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, we just kind of, you know, originally we just kind of took a, a step in the direction of let's architect things that can integrate into things in, in the most agnostic ma uh, manner possible. And where we're going in the future, um, you know, we've got a few other tools that I, that, don't necessarily have to do with open source intelligence, but more have to do with like the things we all hate, like reporting, right? Like who likes reporting or, or even some stuff for like law enforcement, you know, things like, us, like for, for you and me, like, um, you know, mirroring off a website, that's easy We get on, you know, H track, HTT track or W get or something like that. How do we take some of those simple solutions to, to give those over to law enforcement for, evidence preservation or, you know, we've got a lot of things that, you know, that are on the drawing board, but there's still a lot of perfection to, to attain on what we already support. So, um, so kind of I'm, more perfecting the, the, the tools that are already in people's minds that yeah. you're already doing well. Right. And I think, I think right now we've got like six tools out there. Um, and, and it's just some, some stuff takes a lot more care and maintenance. Some stuff we get a lot more, um, wins on and, and some things are just, you know, we, we we're serving a cause with some of the customers that use this stuff. So. Okay. So when you guys are developing these tools, um, what's your long-term vision on uh, open source intelligence or online investigative work? Because we all see the landscape shifting for more streaming video, for instance, which is harder to capture and index, I, I assume, and AI. What's your vision on that? Well, yeah, so a lot of things are going to be moving away more towards image-based analysis. You know, I, I, would, I would boil it down to image-based analysis or even concepts, you know. Um, look, we've been looking at some of the, some of the image recognition um, vendors out there. I found one that's really awesome. It's called XIX. Um, you know, you've, some, of the, some of the solutions that they bring into um, doing image recognition and um, analysis of concepts is is pretty bleeding edge and it actually works. As far as breaking up video streams, um, I think that you know the focus on that would would probably be more towards very specific um, language sets on that stream first. You know, we we haven't dealt too much into that space, uh, but it's it's something that needs to be looked at you know i totally agree and since uh, shadow dragon at least what I, what do i know of you guys you uh, provide in tooling which um most of the time automates a lot of work for an analyst to yeah. view and review and what's your opinion on um the basic hand work stuff with which in well Primarily, when you become an ocean analyst, you need to learn how to do the things just hand on by yeah. hand, no tools. Allowed. What's your vision of that on, in the future? How do you see that change? I think that you you've always have to be living in that tension of moving from manual to something that augments, right? Or you know, it, some of the teams that we support, you know, for instance, on on some of the nonprofit stuff that we support, we will push them to stop using tools at some time. You know, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm on the board of deliver fund, so I get to see some of the operational side of that. Um, but I do, you know, one of the things that we do push on some of those analysts is, okay, you're getting too reliant on a tool because yeah. a lot of this, you know, and even in our, in our, in our training, we've designed all of our training around the premise that all of our tools may be gone in five years. Interesting. You know, it is, it is about a relationship and it's a, it's also about pushing how do we think about the problems, right? So it's, you know, that, that, you know, old saying, if we, if we ask the wrong 
questions a million times, we're going to get the wrong answers, right? So yeah. how do we design scenarios and, and things in training that says, you know, hey, we know you're, you're even using our own tools, but a buttonology, buttonology, that, that's not going to no. get you to the end, even, even, even if we had the best tool ever, intelligence demands that you're going to have to, you know, do a lot of manual work and then let that subconscious part of your brain solve that problem on that third or fourth day when your ego is getting really demanding, you know? So, yeah. um, so one of the things since we're, we're talking about buttonology and all from a, from an end user perspective, uh, using social net or using some of these tools that, that are uh, amazing at, at, you know, like you said, it's at least a 60% solution, getting that information so that an analysts can view it. Um, how do you, wh what do you tell your customers as far as where that data comes from? Uh, because sometimes, you know, you click a button, it gathers all this data and you're like, wow, that was kind of magic. But if you right. have to hand that information off to legal, or you have to handle it off to law enforcement. How do you have confidence, or how do you tell your customers to have confidence that that data is um, is coming from live sources or stock databases or, or things? Yeah. Like that? So I mean, in the end, the the automation is is man is is replicating something that you could have done manually, and okay. and that that manual side of things. Uh, the problem with doing things manually introduces you know boredom which then introduces errors, which then, you know, lowers your repeatability. Um, the automation you just basically streamlines that and then also just goes down a checklist quickly for you. Um, when it comes to anything that's going to be introduced into a court of law, we're getting everything that's open source. We're, and, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that because if we don't if we don't get things that are from open source then you're going to go down that that line of oh well is this all source data mm -hmm. who curated it yep. is this some you know classification data you know are we allowed to have this um so um and then and then you also have export and import controls based on each one of those different things so we're we're sitting on the on the the, the fence of this is you know open source information that you could normally get and when it comes into that court of law, it's, it's providing the people that have found that um, information the ability to go do parallel construction if they need to. So, sure. so if, if something is in your tool or comes back in Multigo or whatever, uh, link analysis tool or whatever tool you're looking at, uh, the analyst should have the ability to go ahead and reproduce that manually if they want it with the data that was acquired. Right. Yeah. Okay. And they, they should be able to do that. And then they should also be able to, you know, if they're going to be taking this to a court of law, you know, the assumption is you're going to be filing a subpoena or you're going to be doing some e-discovery on that. And, and um, there is a legitimate use and, and process behind why you're even using some of these tools or even building up, you know, a dossier or a due diligence process or, you know, um, uncovering the identity of maybe a criminal, you know, so um, okay. that was, that was the, in the background on, you know, I don't commit code on, on that project anymore, but when I did about 10 years ago, you know, that was, we just needed to find as many leads as possible on the things that we're looking at and social media just happened to be a watering hole for people, you know? Sure. Yeah. Great place to share. And you just mentioned uh, Deliver Fund right now. Right. Can you tell me what Deliver Fund is and how yeah. you got involved? Yeah, so Deliver Fund is a, a, a nonprofit um, private intelligence um, group that um, specializes in building um, dossiers and target packages on human traffickers within the United States. And so, you know, you've got a bunch of former NSA, former CIA, former Delta guys that had all gotten together when they, when they got out and decided, hey, you know, like, we need to, to find a way to legitimately get attribution on some of the people that are uh, pushing people as a commodity into the online marketplaces and, you know, turn, help turn that over to law enforcement. And, you know, when I was first introduced to them, you know, like, you know, from a business perspective, you always have a lot of people with a lot of 
you know, insert sad story here, or I want a bunch of free stuff here. And you, you get a little jaded. And, um, you know, I, I, I sifted those guys. I, I, I actually went and did a bunch of work alongside them to see what the work quality was. And, you know, my conclusion was that these guys are real. They're, they're actually operationalizing things in a very, you know, precise and methodical ma manner. Um, you know, it, it's military grade. It's awesome. And, um, you know, from that point on, I was, you know, held with a choice to, you know, do nothing or join the fight. And, and I was just like, this is, I have to do this, you know? So I personally support it, you know, monetarily. I also serve on the board. And then, you know, from Shadow Dragon's perspective, we exclusively give our tools over to all their analysts and then, you know, go and help instruct them alongside their, their teaching methodology for law enforcement. And it's just been, I mean, it's, it's been a great experience for me, you know, like it's, it's just not where I would have expected I would be 20 years ago, just being a, you know, a roughneck hacker kid, you know? Sure. Well, and you know, that's something that we've talked about on the show before is uh, uh, appropriate places for people to practice their OSINT skill and, yeah. and doing something for a nonprofit where you have human lives on the line and children on the line. That's not a place to practice. That's a place where you need to come yeah. with your A game. Um, yeah. If people do have, you know, A games that they want to bring or, or time or money to, to donate, um, is Deliver Fund looking for OSINT analysts? Are they looking for donations or? Yeah, so they are, you know, primarily, you know, we, we do in Deliver Fund, we have all the analysts be in house. So they don't try to outsource it out. You know, they, you know, having a team and teamwork is a really big thing. Okay. Um, there is a selection process, you know, once or twice a year, where people can, you know, go through the interview process and, you know, the testing process, you know, to, to, to see if they want to be a part of the team. Um, you know, but, you know, like the pay is, isn't, you know, what you would get in the A team uh, in the corporate world, sure. but you get to get some, some of the best challenges out there, you know, for, for OSN targeting that's not in a government position where you have to badge in and stuff like that. So, um, and so I bet it's pretty rewarding too. I mean, oh I mean, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, wow. it's, it, you know, like I would say, you know, for me, like the, that big turning point for me, you know, I spent a good 50, 60 hours on, on building the dossier and, you know, the team put in about 200 hours total and, and we got a guy put away for 15 years, you know, nice. uh, and then you've got the outside of that, you know, you have the victims and them pushing the victims into victim services and, and, you know, that it was, it was amazingly rewarding to see that. And it's, you know, you know, usually doing your work, you're, you're just pushing out a report or, you know, maybe, you know, you, on a good day, you've got, you know, five people listening and nodding and saying, that's great. And they cut you a check, but, um, this is much more rewarding. Yeah. yeah. So taking a step back from deliver fund, thank you for sharing for sharing that with us, because I know that, that, that the, the kind of uh, uh, doing OSINT for good is, is really becoming something that a lot of people are interested in. So thank you yeah. for sharing all that. Um, now taking a step back from that and looking at your overall OSINT career and even your hacker career, you know, things have changed in the last 15, 20 years. Yeah. Right? Um, specifically t talking about OSINT, do you see like trends or interesting um, things that you're, that are coming down the pike that you're interested in harvesting? I think you talked a little bit about image processing and maybe AI ML, but uh, tell us what you see in the future for OSINT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's going to be, there's going to be a big change with, with things probably in the next two years on what we've all become comfortable with getting and, you know, so there, there'll be probably a fallback more towards some more manual stuff. And, and then if you haven't, you know, really engineered solutions to get information and in, in open source, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be an, a game of architecture on the, on the larger side, you know, um, we've been feeling that for a few years, uh, as far as what's coming down the pipeline, um, image analysis is going to be a big deal, um, being able to get deeper verification of videos and um, audio. That's going to be a big deal. 
which I think is going to kind of push in more, you know, analysis on the math side. You know, I, I wouldn't call it machine learning. I would, you know, sit, I think there's a lot of space for, you know, fast Fourier, you know, analysis of, you know, things via voice, you know, um, yeah, some of the same things that we've been using for, for years, just applying it to yeah. the, the new audio and video that's come through. Yeah, so, you know, I think there's that. And then, you know, like, just stepping back from the technical side of things, there's, I think there's going to be a greater demand for the verification of conclusions. You know, um, you know we've, we've seen just in the media the last two years, um, whatever political side is pushing the agenda of the day, it's beating people down to the point where they want to, they, I think that they're going to want to be able to say, show me how you got to that conclusion step by step. And I want to know everything. Right. So verification is going to be probably a, a much greater thing, especially even in the journalist world. Um, and, and, you know, like that's just, you know, pushing better craftsmanship into the work. You know? Right. Um, yeah. It's, I mean, it, it goes along with a lot of the things that we've talked about and, and a lot of things that you, uh, you think about, Hey, with an article, there should be some kind of sources that people can point to where they pulled this. You know, you see yeah. quotes all the time. Um, I love the, the Abraham Lincoln quotes, you know, that, you know, everything on the internet is made up and it's, it's quoted to Abraham Lincoln and right, right. Like, just because it has quotes around it does not mean it's true. So I, I like what you're saying there that, that, you know, being able to show this is where I got it and this is the, the confidence level I have in this resource and, and, uh, and showing that you're, you're pulling from good sources is extremely important. Right. And, 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 you know, another thing too is like, um, I don't know how many other people do this, but um, our, like our internal rule is even if you have the best dossier of the day, let's say it's 60% accurate. Your, 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 your best home run, um, everything that you've, you've collected online and maybe you did some all source intelligence went into TLO or wherever else, um, you still need to have a budget to go send contractors and to do some physical surveillance and some form of physical verification of what you found, you know? Sure. Um, so, you know, I, I've been pushing that for, to clients for years and years. And I've seen a good amount of, you know, probably five to 10 customers on the packet ninja side be, you know, be responsive to that and, and really want to know like, Hey, if, if we're spending all this money to do, you know, some OSN and, and some research on intellectual property theft, and we, we think we have these conclusions, we need to verify it to know what, what we're going to do for the next seven to 10 years um, for R and D. You know, okay. is it even real or is everything in front of us a game to get us unbalanced in our, in our, you know, long-term budget. Yeah. So uh, some of the questions that, that some of our attendees have been asking, and thank you to our attendees. I uh, appreciate you, you uh, participating here. Um, uh, they more speak to what kind of advice you would give to somebody, one, that's, that's just starting out in those things, and then two, somebody that's maybe experienced that's looking to up their game. How do they become more elite? So can you speak to those two points about advice you give to people? Okay, so let's start off with that first one. How, how would you get started? Um, for me, I got started more or less, um, I would say, a lot of it had to do with, there was a few papers that SensePost wrote back in 1999 and 2000 on recon, you know? And so if, if we also look at some of the, um, and, and the premise there is also, you know, spending a lot of time on recon, the more you know, the luckier you're, you're going to become, you know? So, you know, you can get some quick wins on some quick things, but then as you're, if you put a goal on, how much time you're going to spend on something and then just apply some scientific process to it. That being, you know, what are my questions and theories? What are my conclusions? Do that every single day and, and just go through a case from start to finish and spend, you know, 40 to 60 hours on it, see what you can produce. Um, that's where I would spend, you know, most of my time. And then don't worry about writing a nice fancy report and, uh, you know, don't care about getting, Famous, I never care about that at all. You know, like, it's 
do your best and then have peer review on that, you know? Um, okay. So, you know, that's how I, I, you know, you know, spent time on getting good at doing pen test stuff and then eventually just ap applied that same kind of target centric analysis to dossier building. You know, it was, it was just an, an extension of the investigative process and then trying to be intellectually honest with myself on, you know, everything I find, is this true or not true? Or what am I looking for? Am I, am I introducing my own bias or am I, um, you know, producing good results? And does the data speak for itself? So um, what the, about for the experienced person, somebody that's been doing it for a while that wants to continue to obviously learn, you've got the Twitters and you've got the social media and there's a ton yeah. of blogs and podcasts. Uh, what do you do to, to learn more and to continue to grow? So, well, I, I've been focusing more the last few years on, on other sources of information, like um, they're kind of boring sources, like articles of organization. You know, so like once I get past the, the person, I want to see, is this person a part of a larger group? And how, how sophisticated is that group? And, you know, if, if they are a little bit more sophisticated, they're usually going to have a few different legal entities um, in a structured manner that, that give way for moving their money across international boundaries. So um, that's something I think if you could get more automation on, on articles of organization across multiple different countries at one time, I think that would be pretty much a game changer for everybody to, to move past just a sole actor to a larger entity um, to see if it's either, you know, a larger criminal organization or, or, you know, state sponsored or not state sponsored, you know? Okay. Yeah. And I know a lot of organizations, I wish Ginsburg, uh, one of our other uh, OSINT curious regular uh, presenters was on here. He just did a, uh, a B-Sides Kansas City event. And at that B-Sides event, he had like an OSINT village and they had Trace Labs come in with their OSINT, um, OSINT Capture the Flag, where they're, they're actually looking for missing people. And I, I love the fact that there's, you know, the, because I grew up in the cyber world too, and mm -hmm. doing pen tests and so there's a ton of hacker challenges, websites yeah. you can go to and CTFs you can participate in. But now we're starting to see ones that are focused on finding that information about OSINT. And I love that to practice. Yeah. And, and, you know, the ICTF, um, open source intelligence uh, stuff that was run by um, Blake and some of the PayPal guys last year at DEF CON. Yeah. Uh, that, that challenge was, was pushed a lot towards, you know, it was a pretty hard challenge, you know, the first 10 levels are pretty hard. And then past that, it was a get your butts out of the seat type. Now you have to go social engineer. So I think that that, you know, just watching all the teams move on that, it was pretty interesting. And, and I would say, you know, capture the flag and then also having peer review and that kind of stuff is always iron sharpens iron. Got to do it, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, so we're getting, uh, Towards the end of the the, the interview here, I, uh, there are there is one other question that we wanted to ask. It's a little sensitive, but you know I figured we throw it out there, and you can feel free to say ah, I'd rather not talk about it. It's about pricing for the Shadow Dragon tools. Um, I know that a lot of our audience they're uh, enterprise, corporate government, but a lot of them are, as you can see in the, in the chat, you know, just starting out and. Right you know, at the, in the single person kind of consultant, are you guys ever uh, thinking about maybe making a, a level of the tool that's more appropriate for a small business or, I mean, pricing wise? Yeah. Not? So, I mean, we, we've done that on the law enforcement side. Okay. Um, and, and then on, on the corporate side, we, we do have like three different tiers of, of, you know, the, the queries per day for social net stuff, you know, so, um, I would, I would, I would just ask, you know, what are some of the budgets um, that they need to kind of fit? Um, as so far as to reach out to you and say, Hey, you know, this is what we're doing. This is what we can afford. Um, do you have a sales team that can work with them or? Yeah, I mean, you do. And, and just, you know, send it in and say, Hey, I was on the podcast and, um, 
as long as long as there it's not just a soul you know <laughs> i'm looking at nico over here nico's like excellent <laughs> right well you know though you know like this is you gotta put stuff out there you know and um we do sift all the inbounds to make sure it's not a, a competitor or b russians or yeah. you know or or see like a country that's doing ethnic cleansing you know that's usually a bad deal yeah. and um so we do put boundaries in there on purpose but that's also so i can you know get in places and and also you know when i'm talking to people i can say look we did due diligence as much as we could and we're kind of good at you know most of this um and i can say like we didn't sell it to insert country here <laughs> you know <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, and that makes a difference too. I mean, because right. putting these tools that can do this really intensive, quick scan of social media and find people that are dissidents, finding people that are anti-current yeah. regime, that could be that could have some dreadful effects. Well, and and if I could just for a second too, like share a little story um, yeah. with OSN and and anything that you're going to publish, you have to really be aware of. Like, let's say in America, we, we grow up in a very right and wrong society, right? Um, while, while other societies are going to, they, they have a different cultural outlook. It's going to be fear and power or honor and shame or, you know, like, it's very different. So, um, and, and we always think of, you know, law enforcement or most of, you know, the government taking very, you know, um, very specific steps towards you know due process and that kind of thing um if you publish something and 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 you push it over to some country that doesn't have any of those norms that have been in place for hundreds of years i will say like you know i've seen the other side of that you know they that that other country may just get spun up because something got spit out um or you know the 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 analysts that pushed it didn't do any due diligence at all, and all of a sudden you've got some team raiding somebody's house with guns. The yeah. results could be very different than the social norms that you are used to within your own country. So, yep. this you know the level of discernment and, and responsibility you got to take it seriously because, um, and and that's also a, a big tension and you know don't try to be famous who gives a crap you know yeah it doesn't matter well, and and the other thing about that which i i love the way that you put that is uh we talk about that a bunch about making sure before you publish something you know we we love sharing information on our blogs and youtube videos and other places and whenever somebody else shares an article i'm always looking at it to see if they're exposing some innocent you know in the name of osint investigations or if they're they're you know appropriately anonymizing content or whether they're just you know calling out stuff and um we've we've talked to i know nico and i and technozet have talked about some some people that are in the osint field that maybe don't do as much analysis as they should um and they're saying hey look that's something that that is a hundred percent, and I'm always like, no, not a hundred percent. In Ocent, there's very few things that are a hundred percent. Right, and I mean, I would say things are getting farther and farther away from a hundred percent correlation. Yeah. Um, even even in the last eighteen months, you know, like, um, you know, like I know, like the hundred percent correlation that I know we had on a lot of different things, it's it's dwindled from you know maybe 10 sources of a hundred percent down to maybe two or three. Wow. You know, like it's just that, that, you know, that golden time period is over and now there's much more of a weight on that confidence and verification and process and, and being, you know, approaching it from a professional's perspective. Yeah. And having peer review. I mean, I've seen analysts who are awesome and at some point, you know, sometimes people go off the rails. Yeah. Yep. Or like you mentioned, you know, it's it may not be intentional. It might just be their personal bias or their or, or something else that comes into play. Um, there was a, a SANS instructor named Jake Williams. I'm pretty sure you, you've yeah. heard of malware, Jake. And he gave a great talk where he said, you know, we train our people to recognize bias and other logical fallacies. And also when you have a report that goes out, multiple people that are trained in this take a look at it. Just 
because you yeah. can only pre-food yourself so much, right? Yeah, we can't live in an echo chamber. And, and, and I think a lot of the tensions that we we all experience on various media platforms, it's, it, it is a consistent echo chamber. Um, yeah. And we just have, you know, patience is a virtue for on a, applied on a lot of different things. Um, and, and, you know, if you're going to be in investigations, you're going to be in OSN stuff, or you want to be a professional, you got to play that long game. It's, it's not about a quick win or a yeah. cool, cool, you know, shame drive by shooting, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, very much so. Because, because when we do that, innocent people get hurt. Right. Exactly. Or, or it doesn't, it doesn't produce the justice that someone might feel that they need to have, you know, yeah. like, um, and that, that's a whole nother <laughs> conversation probably, you know? Yeah. It made me think, though, because I recently had a report and um, I needed someone to look at it just to make sure I didn't skip things or didn't see things or didn't analyze them right. But there was no, no one at my department uh, uh, at that time available. So I uh, asked someone else who I normally wouldn't ask because he isn't in that OSN field. And they came up with even better review comments or conclusions yeah than I would have expected because they looked at it to, yeah, let's say another vision, another perspective, which made me think, ah, I didn't think of that. That's interesting. Yeah. That was, uh, that was uh, maybe uh, it was a friendly reminder for myself to, to be my own devil's advocate a little bit more often. Right. Or yeah, I, I totally agree. Even, I mean, getting somebody that's not in the field to, to do the proofreading, or in another department entirely, but you know that they're intelligent. Yeah. You know, like I get my wife to, to read reports for me all the time. Cause I'm like, Hey, I've spent like a lot of time on this. What do you think? Yeah. Does yeah. it make sense? Uh, what do you think? Did I do anything? And yeah. you know, in that yeah. same talk, um, our Jake talked about how he, um, he had not the fanboy about him or anything, but, um, well. he, he he talked about <laughs> he talked about how one of his best reviewers is somebody that's totally outside of cyber, totally outside of forensics and, and incident response, just is an intelligent person, like you said, Daniel. Yeah. Well, great. Um, Nico Sector Technizet, any more questions for Daniel before we move on to news of the week? Not at this moment, no. No, not for me either. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Do, All right. Do, do any of the other attendees have any other questions too? Like, it looks like we're getting some questions on how do we get started in the investigation side of OSINT? Do OSINT researchers take investigator courses to develop mindset and they're aware of bi cogn confirmation bias? We've kind of talked about a bunch of these throughout our other ones. Um, do you have any quick thoughts before we move on? Hmm. I mean, do you take other uh, people's courses like Intel Techniques or um, Justin Seitz's uh, courses or are you kind of beyond that in your career? I don't know if I'm beyond any of that. Um, I, I read a lot of, you know, uh, Michael's stuff and we're on Slack every now and then. Um, I, I, I've been pushing a lot of stuff into, um, you know, Deliver Fund, so I get to see a lot of stuff like live um so um i'm you know like i i still think you know there's a lot of stuff to learn out there you know like when i'm i'm definitely not at you know a peak of the uh the, the tip of the spear i guess you know right um, uh, but, well i mean there there's a there's a lot out there and yeah because um, i mean a lot of this is just you know some of it's tip, tips and tricks on how to get information and then other things you know getting started on you know being an investigator versus um like there's a big difference between knowing where to look for things mm -hmm. um like a like a forensic guy like he knows where to look for things but he may not know what questions to ask and then the other side the investigator may not know where to look but definitely knows what questions to ask yeah. so a lot of times there's, I think meshing, pushing those two things together is, is helpful. And um, sometimes that's going to be OSINT as the information you're sour sourcing for. Or sometimes it's going to be, you know, deep diving on X-ways or, or a phone or whatever it is, you know, it's, it's going to be some form of evidence. Um, yeah. I, I try to push as, you know, get a, a collection of as many questions as possible 
And then that becomes the checklist at the end, you know, like it's, it's not necessarily, did I go look in all these places? Did I ask enough of the questions? Then I can push that down to, you know, a team member that um, enhances the team and that may enhance the team's productivity by, you know, nine to 12% a year. Well, you know, you keep asking more questions and keeping track of it and you're going to get better, you know. Since you, since you said you, you, you always learn, is there something specific which you have always wanted to learn but not have come yet to learn? Well, you- yeah, so, I mean, so some of the stuff that I want to spend more time on, I would, I would like to spend more time on, on doing some kind of um, fingerprinting of, of car engines. I know that's weird. Mm-hmm. Like no, uh, not with the driving car saying. Like future. no, like I, I have this theory. Like if, if we could, um, I, I think that I haven't explored this at all. Like, but does a car engine produce a unique enough fingerprint? If I did, you know, if I pinged it enough and then did some Fourier, you know, fingerprinting off of that and and normalization, could I fingerprint the pitch of a of an engine, a car engine in an area? You know, like that's something I would like to really like spend hmm, yeah. some time on. I think, you know, that's probably not going to be too realistic, but <laughs> you know, like things with uniqueness that, that you could put up sensors for and, and, and identify in a passive ish way with, with math. Um, that's kind of something I'm interested in. Um, people I'm really interested in the inference of, of body language, tone, um, anything that has to do with truth. I'm always seeking truth, you know, and that, you know, that comes out in a lot of different ways. Um, and, you know, there's business, there's making things, there's um, relationships. I'm, I'm just, I have a passion for truth. You know, what does it taste like? What does it feel like? You know, um, other technical things I would like to get more into um, doing some more, you know, phone exploitation stuff, maybe explore some more, um, you know, avenues on ISM, um, that kind of stuff. And, so uh, you need a lot of rainy Sundays the next couple. Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I need to build the Faraday cage in here a little bit better, right? Yeah. yeah. I need to learn to shut off Slack and all the other right. distractions. And it's so hard nowadays, man. It was. Yep. You know, yeah. It was yeah. I mean, I mean, when we were younger, it was like you know you'd hear the you've got mail and you're like oh let me go check, but then you know the the internet is silent for a large part. Now there's so many ways that you can get yeah. distracted. It's just, uh, it's, and it's hard. And then you, you throw in, you know, you know, family and kids and, you know, you can't, you know, power through something for 70 straight hours like you used to. Yep. Yeah. (laughs) So let me ask you a final question. Is there a book you're reading right now or a um, a blog post that you really like or something you want to promote before we move on to the news of the week? Yes. Yes. So I'm, I'm rereading Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. Okay. Um, I, I think that there's some good gold nuggets in there, um, spe- specifically on economics and also like where we might be uh, in a, the state of global affairs um, in the world. Um, blog stuff, man, I'm I am all over the map on that. I I I've, I mean, we've got OI Monitor like monitoring hundreds of places all the time. I just apply keywords to it, you know. So. Sure. Yeah. Um, there, those are the, you know, that's the, the book that I'm, I'm reading for, you know, my personal life, um, personal interest, work stuff. I mean, it's just a constant barrage of stuff. You know? um, I, I don't get to focus as much as I really want to. I, I have to delegate and, and make sure, you know, everyone's doing what they're doing. You know? Absolutely. Making progress. Well, cool. Well, uh, I hope you can stick around and, and uh, as we talk about these uh, news events of the week and, um, and uh, let's see what we got here. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and share this out. All right. So for those of you that uh, don't know, this is what Daniel Clemens underscore his uh, Twitter account looks like. Uh, please go ahead and give him a follow. And also, I believe we have shadowdragon.io. Just give you a little um, little hit there as well. Also, these links will be in the show notes. Okay, so for other news of the week, Sector, you're on. You had a banner week with um, a blog post not only on your Medium, which we'll get to, but also this one on geometry image forensics that was very well received. Do you want to give a little shout out about it? 
Yeah. Um, well, that was thanks to you, actually. Um, yeah. yeah as, as we see, uh, Nick Furneaux asked a question. Uh, he was busy on occasion. I got just a tiny bit of details about um, what it involved. But he was asked, indeed, to, to find out how far away a person was in, 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 a, in a photo. And he didn't have any kind of information about camera sensors or the device model that the image comes from. And usually you can uh, use that to, uh, to, to determine the size of an object or the distance of an object if you know the size. So I, I already had this in my mind last year and I was thinking about it and I, I wanted to try and do something with that somewhere later this year. And all of a sudden you tagged me on Twitter and said, well, maybe a sector can do something with that. So I just had a little just had a little thing, a little scribble on a piece of paper, and I just wrote the blog. I did the math. I checked it with half a dozen pictures, and well, it works. Um, basically, it's simply just right triangles and um, some basic math. You can all do it in Excel. It's very easy to do, and the more accurate you measure, measure the pixels, the better uh, the results are. And you know, you, you say that it's all just simple math and, and right it, triangles, it really but is. I'm getting cold sweats right now looking at the formulas that you that you shared on here. This is this is uh, uh, I would love for you to do like a 10 minute tip on this and just kind of walk us through a couple of things, because I think that would I mean, you've written it up really well. Um, and also, uh, I think, you know, you just showing us how to, to do it would be great, too. Yep, I'll, I'll think about it. Yep. <laughs> I'll think about it. <laughs> okay, all right. I uh, point taken. Well, well done, sir. This is a, this is a a terrific um, example of the community coming together and helping solve each other's issues and furthering the field. So, thank you for that blog post, and that's on our OSINT Curious page. Uh, Nico, you had this uh, how to spot realistic faces creeping into your timelines thing. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about it? Was that me? Hmm. I think no. It might have been. No, um, no. You, uh, this was. Uh, this doesn't ring a bell. This is no. probably Kirby, that woman. Um, yeah. So, well, one of the interesting things that's happening, and I'm, I have not read this article, um, but uh, remember the the uh, this person does not exist thing. Uh, yeah. How? Yeah, that's what this looks like. Um, remember that this, this person does not exist. I'll go ahead and this person does not exist. Um, we actually did a wonderful thing with, with this page. And th the idea here is that this person uh, that's made up from uh, kind of machine learning AI type of stuff. And I know that I use those terms interchangeably and they're not. Forgive me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a simple man. Um, but this person's physical features have been created via AI and this person should not actually exist. And Nico, you and I actually did some testing. We each downloaded 5,000 of these images and hashed them and we never got the same image uh, twice. So that was actually pretty cool. The point that I wanted to make though, and one of the ways that you can take a look if somebody's just copy pasted information in here, first off, you can see like over here on the right hand side, there's a little blurring here, but take a look at the eyes. And Josh Huff uh, was one of the first people to, to talk about this. Um, one of our other, Baywolf88. Um, if you mm -hmm. look at the eyes of the person, as I refresh the page, the eyes, I'm going to take another one, stay yeah. almost exactly in the same place. So yeah. if you are copying and pasting these images and you aren't shifting it or cropping or whatever to move the eyes around and possibly some other things, I, I, I think this was Kirby's article. Um, but yeah, you can see that there are definite tells here. Um, and this is why this person <clears throat> does not exist. Uh, pictures do not work for uh, sock puppets on Facebook because they recognize the, the perfect alignment of the IP, of the pupils. Yeah. So you need to shift and move around and Photoshop it a little bit more and flip it to make it work. Yeah. I just, um, I, I read an article on a Slack channel, which I'm a member of, about uh, this video. I'm going to post it in the chat right now. I haven't read this article, though, but there's a Is it a, a safe thing for me to click on? Yes, you'll be uh. fine. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's your browser. And there are actually some real live 
uh, models who are actually are moving, who apparently are also AI generated. You're kidding. And they look ridiculously scary real. Yeah. Well, yeah, that does look weird. Oh, and how they morph one into the other is not yeah. not freaky at all. Well, Michael <laughs> Michael Jackson did that, did that in the nineties, right? In his video, the morph. Yeah. Yes. So it's nothing new. <laughs> well, Kirby says that she that that's not her article. Maybe Ginsburg puts it in there. Anyway, um, interesting. It'll be in the show notes. Check it out. Uh, it, it, and this is something that I think. I think Nico, you did uh, uh, put something in there about about how our um, how the the trade craft of people is evolving and how spy craft is evolving. And now with these AI things, we've got real sock puppets that have never been seen before, and we can backstop a profiles now even easier. We don't have to look for a face in a crowd and then blow it up and stuff. Um, do you want to talk about this little spy craft revolution thing that you uh, post that you tweeted out? Well, yeah, my, the article, it's, it's quite a long read for a lot of people because nowadays uh, I notice when something is, is a little bit more than two columns, people tend not to read it anymore. But this is a bit of a long read. But it's an interesting uh, uh, perspective on how the landscape is changing and they call it a spike wave revolution. But it's just, in my opinion, it's more of the changing landscape where it used to be traditional... Uh, people sitting face to face or doing stuff more face to face and now uh, computers are involved which makes it um, sometimes a little bit more scarier because you now you really can't see who's on the other side of the line and you used to see the person's face but it also gives you an advantage because um, there are better ways or uh, more safe ways to blur yourself or your interest or your company uh, to the adversary, for instance, but also, um, well, the rise of supercomputers or uh, computational powers, uh, um, uh, the the quantum computing systems that are coming uh, and mentioned more. Well, what will those new technologies imply for the spycraft or at least um, looking at each other on a more spyish way? Which in which in essence, open source intelligence traditionally was also uh, part of the spy game. Well, and and we can see on the screen right now one of the little blurbs from the article says a cover identity that would have been almost bulletproof only twenty years ago. Only twenty years ago, twenty years is a long time. Um, can now be unraveled in a few minutes. I mean, you have to think about that. You know, we used to, uh, you've all seen those, those videos or you've seen uh, the movies where somebody's like, Oh, you know what? I'll, I'll give them a business card and it'll have your phone number, Nico. And you pretend to be like my boss or something. And that way you'll say, yeah, Mike is supposed to be there. But, Nowadays, you have to have that LinkedIn. It has to be an age profile and the Facebook, and it has to be, you know, have a certain number of friends. Creating that dossier to backstop a, a, a spy profile um, yeah. can be very challenging. Yeah. Daniel, do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that um, you want to share? Yeah. So, I mean, synthetic identity management is a really hard thing to to solve in a scalable way. Um, for for this type of you know use case, I would I would also say um, I think that that whole tag right there, the cover identity that would have been almost bulletproof only 20 years ago, um, you know I I think that like what I've experienced, and you can uncover different identities and see you know who they really are in investigations that you know. On, on folks that may be state sponsored, you know, if they're over the age of 35, then they, they made an OPSEC error 10 years ago. You know, there's high chances that that's in, you know, the Stratford leaks or um, WikiLeaks or, you know, there's, there's a, you know, an entity name mentioned somewhere, which deconstructs, you know, things that, you, you know, maybe trying to engage you online already. So, that's a hard thing. And then, you know, like the, that tension with transparency, like there's a lot more transparency now. Um, I think people are, are saying, you know, 
on one hand, people are saying privacy, but the other hand, it's, it might just be more, more transparency, right? Like there's a lot of things that were always in the public domain. It's just everybody and their mom can get it now. Right. So, um, yeah. it's, it, you know, I think, you know, even for us on, on having, you know, seven or eight different identities for a lot of different investigations, that's hard to keep up with. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it's not just identity. It's not just, you know, right. uh, identity. Yeah. It's that identity has five profiles and it has to stay active. You almost need like a. Yeah. And uh, you have to stay on topic with those five, you know, those five or seven identities. And then how you post is important. How, you know, how do you even get to backstopping that past online stuff? You know, like um, there was a good book. I want to say there was a guy who had infiltrated the Hells Angels, right? And he goes into a lot of information on how they backstopped his identity for those physical operations. Um, I think it was called the hell and back or something like that. And um, that was really interesting because those guys in that book, they would even go and replace information in yearbooks that they knew people would go source like physical information on the backstopping. And that, I mean, add in all the synthetic identity stuff and then put that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just like, I think you, you could focus on backstopping synthetic identities for a long time and it would be really interesting and really yeah. hard, you know? Oh, I, I absolutely agree. And we've talked about that. We'd sometimes refer to synthetic identities on here as like sock puppets or research accounts. Yeah. But yeah, um, that, that is a huge, huge area of interest yeah. for a lot of us. Um, cool. Thank you. Let's shift back over to our main man, Sector. Now, Sector, you mentioned you compiled a your week in OSINT, and that week in OSINT um, this week was not about articles that were out there. This was about open data. Tell us a little bit about what you did here. Yeah. Um, the week before, there was a very interesting link about the uh, traffic information in New York City, and that just... Um, that just had me looking for a little bit more, and I found out where the data set came from, and I found more data sets and more and more. And um, so I thought, yeah, why not just gather a whole bunch of them from all over the world and uh, put them in uh, Week in OSINT? And I found out that a lot of people indeed read my Week in OSINT because a lot of people started commenting like, well, you forgot this one and that one and this one. So I got a whole bunch more now. So. Have you been yeah. updating the, or are you going to update the Medium post? I uh, no, I haven't. I usually don't go back to uh, old Medium posts and update them, because else I can keep on updating everything, because okay. I get a lot of also in DMs. I get so many things sent to me sometimes. It, it's crazy. So I usually I I publish them and that's it. Would you consider uh, taking that list and sending it over to Technozet for her to put that in her, um, in her Technozet no, thing? No need, no need, because Technozet usually, if she has time, she usually goes over all the weekend notices that she missed and she adds all the links that she doesn't have. Okay, I love it. We're a team without you knowing. Yeah, you guys are awesome. So this was neat, and this was really cool because a lot of the data sets that I have and that I know about are United States data, and I love the fact that you've got Australia in there, you've got EU stuff, you know, everybody's like, oh, in the EU, you've got GDPR, you can't do anything. <laughs> well, yeah, but there's some data that's actually published, so thank you so much for including that. Uh, I haven't parsed through it all, but um, some of the stuff was really neat, and... That's actually a great segue into something that Daniel Shep uh, tweeted out, and uh, we'll have this in the show notes. Uh, he tweeted out an accident that occurred over here in the Washington, D.C. area. When he did that, he was able to read the license plate off the vehicle that had done that was in the accident. 
And he tweeted to How's My Driving DC, this Twitter bot that takes the state and then the ID, and it looks up the information about traffic accidents, citations, and other things that's in open data sets for the D Washington, D.C., Maryland area. And what they found was, uh, what he found, or what this bot found, was that this this car that had been involved in this accident was actually had actually twenty eight hundred dollars worth of outstanding tickets. Most of these were for going eleven to fifteen miles over the speed limit, sometimes sixteen to twenty miles, and it goes on and on. So, um, just again speaking to the amazing amounts of data that our governments, especially here in the United States, are publishing about us. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Each time I get amazed by the lack of privacy there is in the United States. Well, yeah. I kind of have an interesting perspective on this. Okay. Um, share. Please share. And this is going to be, you know, for those that are not outside of the United States, um, something a little bit different to, to swallow. But um, in the end, all, all true conflicts are going to be either, you know, they're going to be physical fought with money or, you know, they're, they're, they're one of those two things. Right. So, um, for me, like, as I kind of keep going through my career, you know, you, you, you start off at a certain level of like, Oh my gosh, I'm more paranoid about, or more concerned about these levels of, of, you know, things out there. What am I going to do to lock it down? And then, you, you know, go to the, the end extreme and lock everything down. But in the end, if somebody's going to do enough, and they have enough willpower to show up at my door, I've got the second amendment, you know, and, or I can call the cops and get lawyers involved. Right. So I kind of boil it down to one of those two things is it's going to be, if it's going to be uh, an extreme infringement, it's, it's going to be something where those two things get involved anyway. So, hmm. yeah. In the end, in the end, it, it's, it comes down to, I think, an eye for an eye. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, how are you prepared for that? You know, I mean, like, um, and, and, you know, that I know even for, um, some, some, some of the forensic investigator guys that I've known over the years, you know, like mostly everybody I know now has good biometrics at their offices, just be, not because of like, um, somebody getting angry about their work, but because, you know, paranoid schizophrenic people just show up at the office. Right. Yeah. Like, yep. At, at our office, that's why we put it in because, you know, all of a sudden somebody puts something in the paper, they put some numbers on it, divide by 10, and it equals some secret code, and they're at your office, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, or there was a case a few years ago in South Africa where those uh, there were some forensic investigators that did get shot uh, on people that were they were doing investigations on, you know, so. Yeah, we've talked about Eric Toller here a bunch, and I think actually one of the – the links this week was about Eric, something Eric Toller. I don't know. Um, nope, that wasn't it. Um, but it um, uh, Eric Toller working for Bellicat and Bellingcat and how you know he and Bellingcat as a whole are very proud of the work that they do, especially on the Russians with the polonium milkshakes and stuff. And, yeah. and you know they're talking and outing and uh, these people that are killing people literally killing people yeah. they're like hey that guy just outed this long time russian agent well done dude and like that puts a big tar in my opinion that puts a big target on his back but yeah i i i, I mean those guys are hardcore right yeah. <laughs> and, um what i've also seen too like the the group that i think is probably one of the most powerful too is probably the the cartels and you're talking about groups that have super advanced cyber capabilities. I mean, um, they have unlimited money, they have tons of weapons, and they have almost no moral compass. It's like worse than the Russians. Yeah, yeah it's a terrible yeah. combination. Well, thanks for bringing us down there, down Daniel. That is awesome. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, it's, it's important to think about it, and especially important. A lot of our audience are those people that are looking to get into OSINT and, and looking to um, kind of learn the skills. 
got to make sure that when you one start researching somebody, you protect yourself. Nico has a great blog post on our site that talks about your basic obsec, basic obsec. Yeah. But then also you got to make sure that you start with those safe targets too. Don't go and start looking at Hell's Angels or the Mafia or whatever because they're interesting, but you got to make sure that you know how to do the work before you actually tackle the tougher di- and the tougher targets. Yeah. yeah, and a healthy bit of being paranoid is not a bad thing when you work in this yeah. room. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Absolutely. But don't go overboard. I mean, no, otherwise, exactly. Otherwise, you 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 create you know you create your own fingerprint when you leave your country or wherever, and people are like, "Oh, is this guy something that he's not?" Then yeah. you have a self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. You know? Yeah, got to watch it. And like you said uh, earlier, you know, nothing ever leaves the internet. Uh, there was something that I posted on Usenet groups, Usenet groups, you know, back 20 yeah. years ago. Yeah. And, and it was slightly embarrassing to me, you know, uh, years later, because I was like, oh, I can't believe I posted that. And Usenet groups went away. And I was like, whew, all right. Then Google shows up and they're like, hey, remember those Usenet groups? We're going to index them all so you can Google them. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Um, well, we actually have M.W. Osint as one of our attendees here, and I wanted to say thank you to uh, that person for going ahead and tweeting out this article on tracking a hacker with Osint. Um, Nico did, or Daniel, I, Daniel, I saw that you actually commented on it. Did you have a chance to take a look at this? Yeah, I did. Um, there are some stuff that I private messaged him. Um, just, you know, if, if they – somebody digs into this a little bit deeper, they're going to find the guy's face like, wow. pretty easily. So um, I would just, you know, secure the comments on that thread on your, yeah. on the blog. Cause um, I think the country of origin he was in uh, they're they're going to, they would probably overreact. You know? Gotcha. So again, in that, hey, interesting information, great, in, great content, maybe not go all the way to showing all the details online or uh, anonymizing it or something like that uh, to show the yeah. techniques, but maybe not the end results and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Well, that is actually all of the things that we wanted to talk about this week. Um, we are at the end of the show. So uh, wanted to uh, say thank you so much to Daniel Clemens uh, for joining us here. This has been uh, been excellent having you on here. Uh, I really appreciate how down to earth you are and, and just willing to answer our questions and share your knowledge with us. Thank you so much. Cool. Well, thanks thanks yeah. for letting me get on and um, I'd love to be a part of it and, you know, in the future and, and interact more, you know. Absolutely. Is there any uh, website or any plug that you want to throw out there for um, anything at all, aside from what you've already done? Hmm. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to give a shout out to one of my friends, Zach Payton. Okay. Um, Zach's just been a great friend over the years. He's also your, your eternal hacker. Uh, Just, you know, great, humble guy. If you can, if you can meet him, follow him on Twitter. Um, You know, he's just, he can go down into the depths of a lot of stuff, but also, you know, he's also a great guy to get to know. We'll be at DEF CON this year, all having beers, probably at the old Caesars bar at some point. Usually we always just stay there. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it's, you know, bad habits die hard, right? Um, sure. Um, and you'll probably be at the recon village too, I'd imagine. Yeah. I'm going to try to get there. Um, the, the schedule's pretty tough, but, um, I, I definitely will be at the, at the bar for sure. Um, we're going to see what happens. You know, it's always a right. Yeah, bar. you got you got to set your plan and then just go with whatever happens. I know. Otherwise, it's just crazy. You know. Yeah, that old friend that you haven't seen in fifteen years catches you in the hallway. You're like, holy cow! Yeah, or the guy you've never actually met in person, but you've been on a million list for fifteen years, and oh my gosh! And, yep. Yeah, and you go grab a, a drink with them. So, uh, well, great. Um, like I said, Daniel, I really appreciate you being on, on the show. Uh, just great talking with you. Um, Nico, anything you want to shout out? 
Um, one small thing. There was a small discussion on Twitter on uh, the majority of open source researchers were being male since the field is mostly focused on conflicts and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you women for being there because I've been around, I think where uh, within the Netherlands, uh, I think 60, maybe 70% of my colleagues are female. And I've, First of all, shout out to the tenacity that women have. In yeah, my experience, I, I, where, 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 where men will stop, women will go that extra mile. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that um, you know, a lot of the women that I've, I've worked with, they're a lot better at putting together some of these puzzle pieces. Um, and you know, if I could give one shout out to somebody out there, you know, check out Kara Smith. Uh, the real Kara Smith is on Twitter. Most of her stuff is on Instagram. She's one of the targeting analysts over at Deliver Fund. Uh, she's great in the field. Give her a thumbs up on Instagram. Yeah. Cool. Well and done. that was the article, Nico, that, that was the Eric Toller one. Um, was uh, and I put it on the screen here uh, that he said that you know most of the people are that this is a very male dominated field and I agree with you I mean I, I teach the OSINT class for SANS and my classes are mostly or well, they're at least fifty percent women um, and so I, I wonder if there's a little uh, confirmation bias or just um, selection bias there and that the people that he sees in the journalist version of the, in the investigative journalist area, maybe most of those people are males. Yeah. Um, but Yeah. He shouts out Alexa Koenig from uh, UC Berkeley and they are doing an awesome job at Berkeley uh, teaching people how to do online investigative job where a lot of women are being schooled and doing well, Brenna, for instance, which we mentioned a few times in the show, she's from Berkeley also. So, well, that was just it. I wanted to give a shout out to the women in this field. Yeah. Shout out to the women. All right. Um, cool. Sector, last words? Um, no, no last words. I've really enjoyed listening to everything um, that we've talked about this, uh, this evening. So really nice. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for all your hard work with all of the uh, the blog posts and stuff. That's take a lot of time to put together and really appreciate all the great drawings and diagrams that you put in there. Um, I think Technozet has left us, and I think yeah. uh, Kirby has also left us. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and speak for Kirby here. Uh, Kirby has some public events. Please visit her plesis.net slash events page on the internet and uh, check out the events if you want to learn some OSINT from her. I think most of the events are in, in the Texas area, but check it out. Um, also for me, uh, I have two things and I'm hoping that one of them, uh, I can get this video, this podcast processed in time to, to shout out. I will be speaking uh, on OSINT, on open source intelligence at uh, the OWASP DC chapter on Wednesday um, in nice. Crystal City, Virginia. And uh, so that's an open event. It's a, a meetup. And then also I'll be talking on open source intelligence in uh, the layer eight uh, social engineering and open source intelligence conference next month. So, uh, cool. uh, and of course, you know, stay OSINT curious, everybody. Keep participating, keep sharing. Thank you so much for listening and watching us. Um, until two weeks from now, um, Michael Hoffman, Nico, Daniel Clemens, thank you again, Sector. Um, take care, everybody. Have a great week. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.